Good morning. Welcome to the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District meeting for September 25th, 2020. Uh, we'll begin with the roll call, please. Takes a while to get this together sometimes. Gina, are you there? She's mute on Alex. You guys are mute. You guys are muted. Gina, you have to unmute yourself. Alex is muting me. I never mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real clear on that. I don't mute myself. Alex does it. Good morning. We'll begin with a roll call, please. Thank you. Dr. Botswarf. Here. Dr. Kaufman Gomez. Present. Dr. Gonzalez. Present. Dr. Leopold. Dr. Lynn. Dr. Matthews. Here. Dr. McPherson. Here. Dr. Myers. Here. Dr. Peglo. Here. Ex officio Director Rothwell. Here. Director Rutkin. Here. Director Ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. We have, we have a quorum. We're going to begin. We're we're on a uh, Zoom call this morning, obviously, and if there are members of the public on the call, this is to let you know, we're gonna do our best to make our meeting accessible to you, to recognize people and make sure that everybody who wants to speak to us has an opportunity to do so. I'm not sure there's anybody on the line right now, but we'll know soon enough. The, uh, first thing to announce is that this meeting is being broadcast and uh, or the whole Zoom call organized by Community, Community Television of Santa Cruz County. We wanna thank them for their work. Without them, we'd have a hard time pulling this together, I'm sure. Do members of the board have comments for the board members and the public that are on items not on this morning's agenda? Wait a moment, let's make sure we... I don't see any hands. And Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands either. Okay. If, if do you want to maybe let the public know uh, about the hand feature? I'm going to suggest. Unless the, the, would the staff have a problem if we have people raise their hands simply by putting them up by their head, or they, as opposed to using the formal hand feature? What do you think? So for everybody on the panelist side, you'll be able to see their hands, but in the public attendee side, they'll have to use the hand raising feature in Zoom. Okay. Um, then, and I should also report this meeting is being recorded. Um, let me think. Okay, well, in that case, you can raise I, your hand either way, and we'll, we'll take enough pauses to make sure we capture anybody who'd like to speak to us. And Mike, can I just, uh, this is Donna Lynn. Yes. I had trouble with my audio initially, so I am here for roll call. I think I missed my eye or here. Thank you. That's noted now. And John Leopold is here as well. I think he missed the roll call as well. Okay, um, this is now an opportunity for members of the public, if there are any online with us, to uh, give us comments on items related to transit, but that are not on this morning's agenda. Are there any such comments for us? I don't see any. Don't see any hands, Mr. Chair. We'll wait just a moment. I, we last meeting, uh, we had a couple of people came a little late for oral communication and we'll once again, give people an opportunity to speak if they've gotten online just a few there, moments late. And they've really gotten to know me. Problem. Okay, uh, this is an opportunity for labor organizations to give us comments on items that are not on this morning's agenda. Are there any comments from labor organizations, the unions that, that represent our workers? Mr. Chair, you have Mr. Sandoval. James, good morning. Give us your good morning. comment. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody saw that article yesterday that came out from the County Health Department. 
indicating that Santa Cruz County is on a horrible upwards trend for COVID-19 cases. Uh, they're actually saying, um, Director Mimi Hall, um, and I quote said, we're in such a concerning place right now, our epidemic curve is going up dramatically. And when you compare how exponential our spread is, we're one of the worst performing counties in the state right now. So I haven't heard anything indicating that we're gonna relax on any of our precautionary measures. I just wanted to make sure we keep that in mind moving forward and we continue working together. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Are there other comments from labor organizations or representatives of labor organizations this morning? I see don't see any, Mr. Chair. Okay. Do we have any additional documentation for existing items? Other changes to the agenda? There are none, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, written com comments from the Metro Advisory Committee. I didn't see any when I went through the packet. There are none. Okay, we are now at the consent agenda. This is a item in which we'll take a number of items, all of which are numbered nine dash something, nine dash one through nine dash 10, I believe. And um, we're gonna take one, uh, all of these together in one single action, unless somebody wants to pull one of these, off, one of the board members wants to pull one of these off for further comment and discussion. Let me ask uh, first if there are um, any members of the board who'd like to pull an item from the consent agenda. I see none. Are there any brief comments? Cynthia Matthews wants to pull or have a comment on one of the items. Yeah. Cynthia, go ahead. Uh, I don't want to pull anything, but uh, Alex, maybe when you get into your comment, I just like a little more background on the enterprise resource planning thing. I'm, I'm not suspicious of it. I just want to know a little bit more about it. So, okay, there's a request for the direct uh, CEO's report to cover an item. Any other? Com brief comments, John Leopold. Well, um, I was also uh, going to just comment on that enterprise item. Uh, I was surprised to find out that we still use a system that we, that depends on tape backup. And so I was glad to see us moving forward uh, to, to move in to the 21st century uh, uh, with uh, our, our systems. And so um, it, it, it's always a good reminder that we, the, the back line of uh, this organization sometimes is using the, the latest tools and I appreciate us, appreciate us moving forward to getting those. Thanks. Any other brief comments or items to pull? I don't see any. Let me ask for a motion then to approve the entire consent agenda. So moved. It was, it was moved by John Leopold and I didn't catch the second. A couple of us, I think. Donald Lind? Second, second from her. Uh, state regulations require us to have a roll call vote on each of these motions. So we'll have a roll call, please. <laughs> We're having fun over here. Okay, Director Baltimore. Yeah, I'm glad somebody's having fun. That's important. <laughs> All right. Director Kaufman Gomez. Yes. Director Gonzalez. Yes. Dr. Leopold. Aye. Dr. Lynn. Aye. Dr. Matthews. Aye. Dr. McPherson. Aye. Dr. Myers. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Director Pegler. Aye. Director Rothwell. Aye. Director Rutkin. Aye. We have quorum. I mean, we have. It passed. <laughs> that, carries you, that carries unanimously. Thank you. There you go. Uh, now we're to the regular agenda. And the first item is uh, appreciation of a retiree, and Vicki Trent is retiring. And I'd like to read a resolution, which I will then uh, assume I'm going to take the optimism of assuming will pass after I've read it. Resolution reads This is a resolution of appreciation for the services of Vicki Trent as a bus operator for the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. Whereas the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District or Metro was formed to provide public transportation to all of the residents of Santa Cruz County. And whereas the provision of public transportation services requires a competent dedicated workforce. And whereas Metro requiring an, uh, requiring an employee with expertise and dedication appointed Vicki Trent to serve in the position of bus operator. 
And whereas she served as a member of the operations department of Metro for the time periods of January 3rd, 1978 to May 31st, 1995 and March 6th, 2017 to September 19th, 2020. And whereas Vicki Trent provided Metro with dedicated service and commitment during the time of employment. And whereas Vicki Trent served Metro with distinction. And whereas the service provided to the residents of Santa Cruz County by Vicki Trent resulted in reliable quality public transportation being available in the most difficult of times. And whereas during the time of Ms. Trent's service, Metro improved existing facilities, built new operating facilities, converted the fleet to a CNG propulsion system, developed accessible bus stops, improved ridership, responded to adverse economic conditions, assumed direct operational responsibility for the Highway 17 Express Service and the Amtrak Connector Service, and assumed direct operational responsibility for Paracruise Service and Whereas the quality of life in Santa Cruz County was improved dramatically as a result of the exemplary service provided by Vicki Trent, now therefore be it resolved that upon her retirement as bus operator, the Board of Directors of Metro does hereby commend her efforts in advancing public transit service in Santa Cruz County and expresses concern appreciation on behalf of itself, Metro staff, and all the residents of Santa Cruz County. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be entered into the official records of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District. And now I'm looking for a motion on this resolution. So moved. Most moved by John Leopold, Second. Second. by Cynthia Matthews. Are there any comments in addition? We can't uh, hand a, a plaque over as we would typically do if we were in person, but I'm sure that one will be delivered. Um, and uh, let's now have a roll call vote on this motion. Okay. Dr. Fotsworth? Aye. Dr. Kaufman Gomez? Yes. Dr. Gonzalez? Aye. Dr. Leopold? Aye. Dr. Lind? Aye. Dr. Matthews? Aye. Dr. McPherson? Aye. Dr. Myers? Aye. Dr. Pegler? Aye. Dr. Rothwell? Aye. Dr. Rutkin? Aye. Unanimous again. Thank you. Um, our next item is the CEO's oral report. Alex, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair, directors. Happy Friday. A uh, couple of items here for you, uh, just uh, in the way of new hires and promotions. We had Adrian Jenkins, our, our new senior accounting technician. Um, she's helping us out over in the uh, uh, vehicle maintenance area. She will be replacing Don Martin, who, uh, as you may recall, actually started off in the CEO's office and then promoted. Um, Don is going to be retiring and we're going to miss her. She's been a fabulous employee. Um, at the committees, I uh, briefly talked a little bit about our updated two-year modeling of the COVID reserves. You might recall that as a result of the CARES Act, we were able to identify additional revenues from the prior fiscal year in which we could place those revenues into what you called, uh, what we all called a COVID bucket that will help try to sustain us through this crisis for as long as possible. And the most recent update taking into consideration the most recent sales tax numbers um, do actually reflect, reflect quite a bit of optimism about that bucket being able to help us sustain ourselves through the end of 2021. Now, I will tell you the same asterisks and caveats that we told the committee, that is today, it is a very quick and narrow snapshot um, that could change very rapidly. Uh, and let me just give you a couple examples. Um, when the next set of sales tax revenues, sales revenues come in, um, which will reflect the period of time following the $600 weekly federal unemployment augmentation. You know, we can, at least we speculate right now, that those revenues will be uh, significantly lower. If that materializes, then that gets plugged into the model and the date in which the funds are exhausted moves closer to today, potentially in a very significant way. And then as that occurs from month to month going forward, the model continues to be adjusted. Um, equally, if UCSC uh, does not return, say, in the, um, in the spring and uh, uh, continues to do a significant number of their courses online, uh, they will probably not have a need to purchase back the services that they had pre-COVID. That 
would get plugged into the model. Right now, the model is optimistic that they're coming back and buying their services back uh, early next year. So all those caveats taken. Thank you, CARES Act. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to continue to sustain ourselves. And everyone hopes that uh, as we sustain ourselves at current levels, the economy recovers at some point in a robust way. The other thing that I talked at committee about was FEMA. Um, you know, we sort of had an unlimited ability up until recently to identify FEMA qualifying expenses and to prepare to submit for those reimbursements through the, the FEMA program for about, I think it's either 75 or 80% reimbursement level. Um, however, as a result of uh, one of the, the president's initiatives recently, that has changed in a very dramatic way. Uh, what the president has done is to shift money out of the FEMA program over into a number of his programs that he identified recently, including his proposal for um, federal augmentation uh, at a lower than previous level for those unemployed. So what that resulted in is trans transit no longer qualifying for reimbursement after September 15th. So they will allow us to submit for reimbursements as we showed you last month, I believe it was somewhere in the 200,000, 200 to 300,000 range, uh, but we will not be able to accrue any other FEMA qualifying expenses because there is no more money that transit qualifies for in the FEMA program after September 15th. So how did that impact us? Well, for us, it, it impacts us obviously because we anticipated continuing to accrue expenses against uh, potential reimbursements from the FEMA program but we were also working on moving from the temporary uh, clear plastic curtain bus operator uh, curtain, as you know, that we installed in all the buses to a permanent plexiglass concept. And we were hoping to get um, 75, 80% of that funded through the FEMA program. We will now have to figure out a way to do that uh, um, self-funded because we won't be able to put it through the FEMA program. And then lastly, you had requested earlier that I talk just briefly about the ERP, the Enterprise Resource uh, System. And uh, this started out, as you probably will recall from the past several years, when we've been talking about our FIS system, our financial information system, and how antiquated it is and how uh, it, it just has no flexibility and it forces us to continue to be highly spreadsheet based. And, and um, I know from experience, agencies get themselves in trouble when they are too dependent on spreadsheets. Um, you really need to have your financial system in, in an enterprise system or in a program. Um, so we started on this journey several years back. It's had some fits and starts because we've had some financial challenges. And then at some point you allowed some money to be identified to bring a, a consultant uh, aboard uh, as we got closer to this item that you have before you, uh, we started thinking about it more broadly. That is, we have other antiquated systems, systems that don't talk to each other, systems that are no longer supported by their vendor, or we're on notice will not be supported by the vendor. So we've expanded this item um, to the enterprise level so that we look at all of those systems with this consultant's help and identify which ones are the highest priority. It may not be that FIS is the first one we should launch. So that consultant will help us identify which ones are the highest priority um, and the order that we should implement them and, and the way that we implement them so that once we start down that road, when we get to the end, we don't end up with antiquated systems that we put in place a year or two or three earlier, right? So they'll help us with that. And then in, in, in parallel with that, we of course have to identify the money to support the purchases of those modules. Could be one or two a year that are implemented, could be one, we'll see. We need this expertise that we do not have in house to come in and help us. Through this item, that consultant will help guide us through the entire process. Um, that is looking at what we need, helping us to develop the scope of work for a future procurement. Um, most important to this process is that you look at process changes. What, you, what I mean by that is you don't want to buy systems and then customize them to your current processes. That's a nightmare. 
uh, and agencies make mistakes when they do that. You will always have some level of customizations, but our, our uh, anticipation here is that along this journey, we will revise our processes to the greatest extent possible so that we can adjust our processes to what you would call, quote, the off the shelf software. So that's, that's the journey that we're on. They'll help us with the scope of work. They'll help us with evaluating respondents. They'll help us with implementation. And as you know, from your experiences at your agencies, when you get to that implementation stage, that's a real important uh, process because you wanna make sure you're running your two systems side by side before you turn off your old system in order to avoid any kind of catastrophe. Um, so that's, that's in a nutshell why we need this kind of expertise to help us guide through what is going to be a multi-year um, process towards a new ERP. Thank you. Are there questions about this program from any of the board members? Um, no, but I, I really appreciate that. Just from the report, it looked like there were a whole lot of antiquated systems. So um, yeah. do you, can you just give us a rough timeline for the RFP, choosing the consultant, and any idea of a ballpark um, contract amount. Okay, now let me punt that to Angela and see if she has a preliminary just, idea or Isaac. Just to overview. Support. Are we waiting? Are you going to get back to us? Uh, let's see, I was just looking for Angela to comment on that. She might be having audio issues. Morning, Angela. I see she's on now. Oh, she's, she's in the forest up there, so. <laughs> Isaac, you want to jump in while she works on her audio? Okay, well, um, are we asking about the timeline on the initial, um, the procurement for the, uh, the consultants or the entire project? I was thinking initially just to get it going. Okay, well, we're looking at the consult, et cetera. Well, we already have a scope put together, so... You know that that's a that's a major yeah. element is to get that scope built out, and the rest of it is just um, uh, getting on the street with procurement. So I'm guessing we're looking at probably 60 days, uh -huh. and at that point, then we can initiate. And any idea of ballpark what you're looking at? Just curious for the, for, for the contract. For the contract, well, we're looking at uh, we don't. Envision it exceeding fifty thousand at this oh, okay. point. But, but I just wanted ballpark. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but it could. So yeah. if it does, we'll come back and talk to the board about yeah. that and make some recommendations. Uh, and then, Mr. Chair, before I uh, give up the microphone, I just wanted to do one last item at the uh, Capital Committee. I think uh, Director Matthews had requested that we. Uh, um, introduce Sandy Woods. I think we introduced her on paper to you previously, but not in person. And Sandy Woods, our newest uh, project manager is here and and uh, on screen. Hi, Sandy. Welcome Hi, to- Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank good morning. You. Sandy will help us, help guide us through the implementation of numerous projects and help us to try to expend uh -huh. grant funds in a timely fashion so that we can compete better for future grants. Thank you. Thanks for the CEO's Thank report, you. Alex. Our next item and in fact, the next two items have to do with our representation in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. As a board members certainly know, and most members of the public, I assume, know, but perhaps not. Uh, we do not uh, operate the system based solely upon the uh, fares paid by our riders. We're heavily dependent upon public funding locally at the state and the federal level. We are well represented by Josh Shaw and Michael Pimento, who, who, Tim, Tim and Tell, who are here this morning to give us an update on what's going on in Sacramento. We are often hemmed in by Sacramento, required to do things uh, without having funding to support it and so forth. And it's critical that we have representation to uh, help us make sure that we don't have, we don't uh, get uh, uh, stripped of funds that we absolutely need and, and then get the funds that we do need out of Sacramento. So let's have our California uh, lobbying report in effect. We really appreciate your work and, and want to hear from you this morning about what's going on in Sacramento. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry to preempt Josh real quick. Yeah. Can we just double back? We, we neglected to do the public comment on the CEO com, uh, comments. Oh, thank you. Sorry, Josh. Just a moment. <laughs> sorry, Josh. <laughs> Other members of the public like to comment on the, anything that uh, CEO Alex Clifford just told us. 
I don't see any hands, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Sorry, Gus. Now go ahead. All right. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Ruckin. Good morning, board members. Uh, Josh Shaw here on your state legislative advocacy team calling in from Sacramento. And I am here, as the chair mentioned, uh, with my colleague, Michael Pimentel, who's integral to our firm's transit practice here in Sacramento. Sounds like Michael might be on mute. Yes, good morning, um, Mr. Chair and board members, Michael Pimentel, legislative advocate with Shaw, Yoder, and Tweet Schmelzer and Lang. I uh, really do appreciate the opportunity to be before you here today. Good to meet you. So board, so board members, uh, as we begin today's quick discussion and legislative wrap up on the state uh, legislative affairs, I just wanna remind you of the obvious, but with a little extra spin on it, the unprecedented and truly historic nature of the pandemic and its effect on all sectors, public, private, and nonprofit, included an adverse impact on the state's legislative and executive procedures and processes. For instance, when Michael and I last saw you at your February board meeting in Santa Cruz, it was the beginning of a year, times were significantly different. We were full of energy, interacted with you and board members on a whole uh, uh, suite of expectations for the final year of the 2019-2020 two-year legislative session. We were expecting a healthy state budget, uh, strong transit funding, as the chair mentioned in his opening remarks to our item here. We were preparing to engage for Santa Cruz Metro on several high visibility bills impacting public transit, whether adversely or opportunities that we saw for transit to help you do your job uh, even better. Uh, including, for instance, three bills that we focused on and interacted with you quite a bit. I remember several board members made a lot of comments about a package of bills that would have mandated essentially fair fee, fair free transit, free transit for a certain uh, number of ridership demographics, whether students or older Californians, et cetera. Of course, in, as soon as we got back from your February board meeting, a week or two into March, the shelter at home order because the pandemic had hit California and hit hard, forcing legislative leadership to temporarily suspend the legislators uh, session, the legislative session by way of first an extended spring recess when they figured out, can we come back to Sacramento and meet as a group? Would it be socially distanced? Can we do calls to, to legislate like this? So they took a long time to figure that out. Uh, later, they did come back after an extended summer recess and by July uh, did return to carry out the work of the people. Uh, uh, but all of that undermined our usual expectations, thwarted movement on a whole range of measures, touching a bunch of policy sectors, uh, including public transit, uh, basically anything unrelated to COVID-19, almost anything was as, uh, set aside. But after fits and starts, the legislature did return to Sacramento in late summer and carried out its business. And with that compressed legislative timeline, a shakier state budget, the fair free transit bills, as a for instance, like many other bills impacting transit at the time, were put on hold for 2020. What emerged then was really a singular focus on the COVID-19 pandemic and various forms of relief, uh, including a raft of new bills. Many bills were gutted and amended in July when they came back. If we'd have told you it was about one thing in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, all of a sudden in July with two months left in the session, a bunch of bills got turned into something completely unrelated, often with a focus on COVID-19 to assist in some kind of recovery uh, in terms of the view of the legislators reintroducing those new bills. So on behalf of Santa Cruz Metro, we engaged with your state delegation specifically and regularly and with others, of course, in legislative leadership positions, uh, whether budgetary or policy with overseeing the transit world to try to generate momentum for some additional relief for public transit. We saw early and obviously that there would be passenger fare declines across the state and at Metro, and then you would be worried about your sales tax declines after that. Unlike what Chris and his colleagues were able to achieve in Washington, D.C., uh, uh, when we at first thought there was some promise for relief coming out of the state legislature uh, as a result of the pandemic, and despite our push and our documentation for your delegation, we worked with Alex and Angela and Danielle and Wanamu to, to uh, frame up the particular challenge facing Santa Cruz Transit as a bunch of transit agencies, of course, we're doing across the state. Despite all that push, the legislature essentially punted on any further discussions on any new state expenditures 
for the most part, any new COVID relief for any sector, uh, public or private, much less public transit. So ultimately, the legislature did adjourn late the night of August 31st. That's the usual uh, adjournment day for an even numbered year like this when there's a general election coming up in November. They did send hundreds of bills to the governor for his action, whether veto or signature. By the way, the amount of bills they sent is about 75% lower than you know, the data would show in any normal decade. So it was a constrained year. Uh, the governor still has five days left in this month to act on some of the bills, including a couple of the transit bills that Michael's going to talk about. Um, and then just as a preview, of course, following the November general election, a new class of legislators, the 2021 through 2022 class, which will include mostly returnees and incumbents, but some newly elected uh, legislators will be sent to Sacramento for the first time. They'll come back to Sacramento on December 7th for a quick organizing session. They, they go home then for the rest of the calendar year, come back to Sacramento where we will see them in January to formally start the work of the 2021, 2022 legislative session. I'm going to turn it over to Michael Pimentel right now to briefly touch on some of the bills that arose brand new that were not even in print when we last saw you in February that had some impact on public transit. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, so thank, thank you so much, Josh, for, for that tee up and, and, and board members. As Josh noted, when the pandemic hit Sacramento, uh, nearly all the legislative efforts were refocused on COVID-19 response and recovery. Uh, one such recovery measure introduced in the legislature and now on the governor's desk is SB 288, uh, which creates a series of new statutory exemptions from CEQA for various transit project types. Now we engaged on this bill uh, to see included a new language to exempt from CEQA charging and refueling infrastructure for zero emission buses. Now this should help greatly in easing the administrative burden and costs of these projects and ultimately should support Metro's long-term transition uh, to zero emission bus technologies as mandated by ARB's innovative clean transit regulation. Now on the response front, uh, we did see three measures introduced related to expanding access to workers' compensation. Now these measures pursued at the behest of our brothers and sisters in labor uh, would create new presumptions, essentially lower proof thresholds for claiming COVID-19 infections are work-related and for ultimately accessing workers' compensation benefits. Uh, this measure before you, SB 1159, uh, would create a new rebuttable presumption, uh, which would shift the burden of proof for disputing filed claims uh, to the employer. Now, as a result of several of the amendments we pursued, uh, this new presumption is one that would be made contingent on an employer facing an outbreak of COVID-19 at their specific place of employment. Now, the traction of SB 1159 meant that necessarily that one competing measure, AB 196, uh, which would have created a conclusive presumption for COVID-19 related workers' compensation claims was held in the Senate. Now, had that bill passed, had it been signed by Governor Newsom, it would have established as a matter of law that all COVID-19 uh, related, I'm sorry, all COVID-19 infections uh, that were experienced by employees while at work are inherently work-related. But again, uh, that measure was held uh, in the Senate, not under consideration by Governor Newsom. Now, finally, now finally, we didn't. While we didn't secure funding this year uh, for transit agencies as part of the state's uh, ongoing work, we did secure a series of meaningful statutory and regulatory relief measures through two rounds of budget action. Uh, these measures include several that were directly shaped. Uh, by CEO and General Manager Alex Clifford to better align with Metro's specific needs. And I'll hi highlight just a few of them, uh, but just know that there were uh, a, a series of measures um, that are on your screen that we did pursue in, in total. Uh, so measures that I'll highlight include the suspension of the financial penalties for noncompliance with TDA and FTA's efficiency uh, criteria. Uh, to give you one explicit example, uh, we did uh, manage to secure a suspension of the financial penalties related to noncompliance with fare box recovery ratios. We know that for many transit agencies today, particularly as you've waived fares, that has created some challenges for agencies 
meeting their fare box recovery requirements. Uh, we did also secure some new flexibility in the use of the state's state of good repair program fund, allowing these funds, which have typically been used for capital projects, to now be used to explicitly save transit service that would otherwise be cut as a result of COVID-19 impact on your operating budget. We were also able to secure an extension of the use of low carbon transit operations fund. And this was a specific request of LA, uh, I'm sorry, of Santa Cruz Metro uh, as they were uh, considering um, the, the use of funds that had been previously awarded to them. And then very finally, I'll highlight uh, deadline extension uh, for the submission of ZEV rollout plans that are mandated by the Innovative Clean Transit Regulation. And I'll now hand things back to Josh are, Shaw to touch. Let me ask what are ZEB rollout plans? Yes, sure thing. So as part of the Innovative Clean Transit rule, there are a series of requirements for facilitating the transition to zero emission bus technologies. That starts with the requirement that transit agencies submit a zero emission bus transition plan. And that transition plan is meant to outline their schedule and the technologies that would be used for meeting the requirements of the ICT regulation. Now, the specific relief measure that we secured is one that would actually impact the largest agencies in our state uh, that would delay the requirement for them to submit their plan. But we do fully anticipate that as part of our ongoing discussions around statutory and regulatory relief, one of the things that we would pursue when the time is right uh, would be similar relief for the smaller agencies like Santa Cruz Metro that would be charged with submitting the rollout plans come 2020. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. No problem. So at this time, I'll hand things back to Josh Shaw to uh, close up the discussion and to touch on the funding landscape here in Sacramento. Thanks for your work, Michael. We appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you. Josh, Josh you're on mute. Still on mute, Josh. Gina, can you unmute him by chance? No, we can't. He has to unmute himself. Josh, you have to unmute yourself. We can only tell him that he needs to unmute himself. <laughs> he may be having technical problems. We'll wait a moment. This is the COVID-19 environment. So, Mr. Chair, if, if you don't mind, I can handle the remainder of this presentation. Okay, please do. So, so board members, I will highlight that as part of the this year's uh, regulatory, uh, re regular legislative session, uh, we were laser focused on the impacts of COVID-19 on the operating budgets of transit agencies. And one of the clear impacts that we did see was that for several of the state's primary funding programs that impact public transit, you did see some significant declines uh, in funding. Now, these are, these are declines that are the result not necessarily of any specific actions the state took, but rather just the underlying fundamentals of the economy. Uh, so, for example, uh, we're looking at the state transit assistance program, which is funded by diesel sales taxes, and the Transportation Development Act, which is funded by a quarter cent sales tax applied to all sales of any goods here in the state of California. As the economy has slowed down, we've seen declines in those revenues. By the same token, we've also seen significant declines in the revenues that the state's cap and trade program has brought in. And that is a result of just decreased economic uh, activity. And as a result, that has created significant uncertainty uh, around the state of the cap and trade market. As a result, the state did punt on taking any action on its cap and trade expenditure plan uh, for this year. But there are some brief glimmers of hope that the economic landscape here in the state of California are improving. Uh, and, and to highlight just some of the, the factors that we are seeing, we are seeing an uptake, uh, an uptick rather, in economic activity across the state. State is bringing in more revenues than it that than were anticipated with regards to sales taxes and with regards to income taxes, and we expect that we'll know more about the state's budget outlook when it comes uh, to the governor's newly released budget in January. And so we'll report to you later 
uh, in, in 2021 to really highlight for you what the pandemic's true impact was on transit budgets as it relates to state funding program. And Michael, and at this time, we'll open it up for questions. It, Michael, let me jump in before we open up for questions. Mr. Chair, I will note there was some specific transit good news earlier this week. As it turns out, the timing is great. Day before yesterday, I'm sure you all saw the press that Governor Newsom announced a sweeping new package of measures intending to combat climate change during his press conference standing next to the Air Resources Board Chairwoman. Uh, Governor Newsom mentioned the role of public transit. Uh, the board, the car board chair mentioned the regulation, Mr. Chair, that you asked about and, and that Michael responded on and noted that the state has got to help and partner with transit agencies to not only accomplish their requirement to convert all transit buses to zero emissions as part of the effort to combat climate change. But moreover, she said the more important thing the state has to do is help transit agencies expand service, come up and out of this pandemic, return to at least where we were in serving our public, if not go way beyond that to provide even more and better public transit for all to to really contribute to the state's effort to uh, combat climate change. So that's our presentation for Sacramento. We are happy to answer any questions. Are there first questions from board members on the situation in Sacramento? I'm not seeing them, but I don't see them all now. Uh, Mike, this is Bruce. Go ahead, Bruce. Uh, you said, I think they said that some capital money will now be okay for, I think, operations that wasn't before. Is there a shift? How much are we talking about? And can we, what's the sense of how that much that might mean to us? So I can feel that. Yeah, I can feel that question in the initial. So the the program that we're we're speaking to specifically is the State Transit Assistance Data Good Repair Program. Every year, that program as a whole provides about 105 million dollars to transit agencies statewide. And Santa Cruz Metro does get a portion of those dollars based on its historic share of the State Transit Assistance Program fund. Now, I have to do uh, a bit more research to provide you the specific allocation that Santa Cruz receives year over year. But the parameters of this new flexibility uh, would allow you in instances where you would be otherwise cutting service to be able to repurpose those dollars to preserve that service. So it is very narrowly focused on, again, preserving service that otherwise would be cut, but it does create some new flexibility uh, that in years past has just, just been a disallowed use for those program funds. Thanks. Are there other board members with questions, comments? Do you see anybody? I don't see anybody. Okay. Are there members of the public who might like to comment or ask questions about the presentation? Don't see any hands, Mr. Chair. No, neither. Okay. Well, Josh and Michael, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank for your representation of us in Sacramento. It's very important. And for your work with Alex, who also serves on several statewide committees that are obvious and critical work for us. Next, we're going to hear from our uh, advocates in Washington, D.C., uh, Capital Edge Group, which is headed by Chris Giglio. And Chris has ably represented us over many, many years in Washington, D.C. And a great deal of our funding comes from the federal government and less in the way of regulations than from the state, but certainly funding is critical from Washington, D.C. So we're going to get a legislative update from Chris. Chris, welcome and good morning. Welcome to Santa Cruz, at least virtually. Thanks, uh, Chairman Rockin. I appreciate your uh, uh, having me. I uh, wish I was out there uh, in person, as I told you earlier. Uh, actually, the last time. I stepped on an airplane was after the February board meeting. So uh, um, hoping to hoping to get back there in person too. And also, uh, you know, just thinking about all you folks out there who who have been sort of personally impacted by uh, this kind of double gut punch of COVID-19 and and uh, terrible wildfires. Um, so I, I've been thinking about you uh, here in DC. Um, it's it's you know just like in Sacramento uh, and and in Santa Cruz it's been a, a strange year uh, since since I last saw you in February uh, here in D.C. Uh, Congress has kind of been operating under kind of a modified 
virtual situation where members are sometimes here, sometimes they're not here. They're either voting virtually or not virtually, mostly in the House. The Senate, uh, the Senate has tried to keep their activities in person, uh, some hearings uh, virtually, that sort of thing. But it's been very quiet. You know, the public's not allowed in the Capitol building. Uh, lots of staff have sort of decamped uh, to various places around the country, you know, especially the young ones. They, they've gone home, uh, you know, and uh, with their families and, and, are, and are conducting their business from there. So it's been it's been a challenge, but I think they've done a, a, a pretty a pretty decent job of it. So, um, and I'm not as good at sharing my screens and all of this Zoom stuff as Michael is. And so thank you for Community TV for running this. Uh, you can go, uh, go ahead with the first slide or the next one after this. Uh, I also am blaming uh, the wildfires, COVID, or anything else on uh, somebody taking, you know, getting rid of my spell check on my uh, on my PowerPoint there up on the top. So I apologize for that. Uh, but here's some of the things I just wanted to mention uh, today, uh, and they're probably all pretty familiar to you. Of course, uh, COVID-19 relief. Uh, we uh, starting on October 1 uh, will be the new federal fiscal year uh, of FY 2021. So talk a little bit about the budget. Uh, the 2015 FAST Act, which, uh, as you all know, authorizes the um, uh, federal transit programs and, and as well as the Highway Trust Fund that funds all of those programs, that expires on September 30th, and so Congress has to deal with that in some way. Uh, we've talked before, uh, last, we've talked for the last several years about an infrastructure package, and uh, that comes up uh, here and now, uh, here and now. And then, of course, just a, a little bit about uh, what, what the elections could mean. Uh, for, for next year. So next slide, please. So COVID relief, uh, Alex mentioned this uh, before uh, in his CEO report, uh, but in, uh, in March, as you all know, uh, Congress enacted a, a $2 trillion package of, of COVID-19 relief uh, known as the CARES Act. Uh, never, ne Congress never lets an opportunity to have a, a goofy acronym go by. And so we've, uh, the CARES Act uh, stands for something I can't even remember. But uh, uh, most importantly uh, for us, it included $25 billion uh, for public transit. It was a, it was a very effective um, uh, uh, lobbying effort by APTA, uh, by Santa Cruz Metro, by everybody to get that, uh, to get that transit uh, funding in there. Um, however, you know, the bad news is that uh, APTA and others estimate that, uh, that the transit industry will need at least another $32 billion uh, by uh, before the end of the year to kind of keep everybody whole, given the sort of cratering sales taxes, the ridership, and all the things that you are are well familiar with. And uh, the CEO and we and 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 you folks on the board have been uh, been really great about advocating for more funding. We've uh, you know uh, the CEO in particular has challenged me to contact whoever will listen here in Washington uh, with regard to that. He's, uh, uh, he got together a letter of uh, some of uh, colleague kind of uh, small, medium-sized systems who would be you know, really uh, impacted uh, by the loss of, of additional COVID-19 funds. And um, getting that um, letter all over Capitol Hill earlier this year uh, was, was effective. Uh, the White House and the Senate Republicans, you know, sort of there's this three-headed uh, negotiating monster over COVID relief, and it involved House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Mitch McConnell, and the Senate uh, uh, from the Republicans in the Senate and uh, the White House. Uh, the White House and the Senate have floated their 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 COVID relief plans, their next steps. Uh, none have included transit, not necessarily because they oppose transit. It's probably more of a negotiating tactic. They know that the Democrats, House Democrats, are going to want transit funding in their next bill, and so uh, they, they leave it out for leverage. Uh, the House earlier this year passed what they considered to be the next step uh, uh, in, in COVID relief. They, uh, the acronym there was the HEROES Act. It was $3.5 trillion uh, across the board with lots of uh, assistance for lots of different areas, $16 billion of it for transit, um, however, we were disappointed to see that the distribution formula for uh, that $16 billion in the House uh, Democrats Heroes Act was, was severely flawed. Uh, the $25 billion uh, from the CARES Act was distributed, in, and I'm sure that Alex has talked about this uh, a lot, uh, but it was distributed using existing formulas. Uh, and so everybody got a piece of that $25 billion. 
the House $16 billion transit uh, funding in the HEROES Act decided that it would only, but that the great majority of it, uh, I think uh, 12 or 13 billion of that 16 billion would be distributed through a formula that only allowed for um, uh, urbanized areas of over 3 million in population to receive it. And so as a result, uh, only 14 you know, areas in the country were gonna get that money. So again, um, uh, with the CEO's help and, and some of our colleagues, we've been sort of fighting that distribution formula for, you know, for whatever that next tranche of money for, for transit, if, if and when it comes, uh, to, to just go back to what worked before. And that was the CARES Act, distributed it using existing formulas and you know, keep everybody, uh, keep everybody whole. Uh, we, we continue to fight for that. Uh, last here is, uh, you know, will there be any COVID-19 relief pre-election? I, I, uh, if you had asked me a month ago, if you'd asked me two months ago, I would have said uh, there's a really good chance of that happening. Um, as we get closer and closer to Congress wanting to go home and uh, um, uh, campaign for the month of October before the November elections, uh, I'm starting to be less and less uh, positive about that. I think barring a a real breakthrough in the next couple of days, really. Uh, I think we'll see Congress next week uh, adjourn uh, until after the election without doing a, a COVID relief package. The, um, the White House and the Senate Republicans seem to be hovering around a, a $1 trillion overall price tag, uh, whereas Nancy Pelosi uh, and, and House Democrats have kind of moved down from their original 3.5 billion in the HEROES Act to about 2.2, 2.4 billion. They, they believe they're trying to meet right. um, the Republicans halfway. Uh, nobody's blinking. Uh, and so I'm, I know I, there's a lot of things that have a lot of support, um, but nobody wants to let go of their leverage uh, and, and give in. So I, I think we're, we're at loggerheads at least until, until after the election on COVID relief. I hope I'm proven wrong hope over the weekend, you know, uh, the speaker and the White House meet and they come to an agreement, but uh, I am not, uh, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, next slide, please. So, and a lot of these things are sort of all related. These, the, you know, the, the FY 2021 budget, I mentioned the, the new fiscal year starts on October 1. Um, the, uh, the budget process starts in February when the president makes his recommendations for, for the, a budget for the next year. And as the White House has done in the last, in, in all the years they've been in, this particular administration has been in office, they have recommended pretty steep cuts to uh, the Department of Transportation budget. Uh, this year it was a 19% uh, reduction. Every year Congress has, has rejected those, uh, those proposed cuts. And this year the House was no different. Uh, the House in the summer approved an FY 2021 budget for the Department of Transportation that rejected those cuts. It funded um, all of the transit programs, formula and competitive programs, kind of at or near the, um, the numbers that were authorized in the 2015 FAST Act, and actually gave some of them increases, like the bus and bus facilities competitive program, the, uh, the competitive program that funds uh, zero emissions buses. Uh, they, they, added, they actually added money to that, which is somewhat unusual. They've been doing it in the last few years, but in general is pretty unusual. House appropriators often feel hemmed in by the authorization levels that are sort of handed to them by another committee and they often don't change them. Uh, but this year in the, in the past years, they've, we've, we've gotten some, some increases. So, uh, so that's been a good thing. The uh, unfortunate part is the Senate has not been able to come to an agreement on how they proceed with their 2021 budget. So they have done nothing formally in the 2021 budget and we are now, what, six days out uh, to, uh, to October 1. So, uh, and this has happened in the last several years too. Uh, partisan differences prevent uh, budgets from being finished right before the official start of the fiscal year. So Congress approves what's called a continuing resolution or CR. And uh, what that does is that essentially keeps the government running in the absence of a, an enacted formal budget. And it kind of keeps it running at, you know, sort of its current levels. Now, the problem with a CR is while the government is not shut down, the agencies are also not really anxious to uh, come out with a lot of new policies, programs, and that sort of thing, because they, they know they don't have a final budget, and there's always a chance that they could be sort of cut back, uh, and so they don't want to step out. So it's, it's really kind of a, you know, kind of a stand-in-place uh, budget. 
uh, that'll that'll probably delay some uh, some grant programs from being uh, from being announced. But uh, the House passed yesterday. I believe it was yesterday or Tuesday. Uh, the House passed uh, uh, yesterday or the day before their version of this continuing resolution. It's a bipartisan continuing resolution, so the Senate will probably vote out on a Thursday, and the government will continue to run um, at least through December 11th uh, when this uh, particular CR is there. Uh, another interesting part of this, this CR is that it, because uh, our, our federal highway and transit programs are funded by the Highway Trust Fund, which is funded with federal gas tax revenues, um, Congress needed to add an additional $14 billion from the general fund to DOT's budget in this just to keep the government, the, these programs running at their current levels. And so that shows you sort of the revenues from the gasoline taxes going into the highway trust fund that pays for these programs is severely lagging. And so uh, it's a, you know, it's something that we're, we're going to be, you know, sort of dealing with again for the, for the next year. Next slide, please. The FAST Act, another uh, acronym, which I can't remember uh, what it is, but essentially it's the, uh, it's the legislation that authorizes federal highway transit and railroad uh, programs. It was passed in 2015. It was a five-year bill and it expires in, uh, in six days as well. Um, the House uh, this, this summer, uh, you know, sort of presented its version of, of a reauthorization bill. It was a five-year, $5 billion plan passed on the floor in July as part of a uh, larger uh, infrastructure package. Uh, it was very generous to transit, uh, included a hundred billion dollars uh, more over those five years for, for public transit, a 54% increase over, over current levels. Um, and another highlight was our beloved uh, small transit intensive cities program, the STIC program. That's a good acronym. Um, that one uh, is going to get an increase uh, from its current level of 2% of the transit formula program to 3% of the transit formula program. So that means more money for, for Santa Cruz Metro through, uh, through that program. The Senate but has I, moved a little bit on their- Can you hear me? Can I interrupt you just oh, to yeah, ask? Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. I, the, um, are we at some risk because our factors for getting stick have to do with ridership, um, among other things, uh, miles traveled, et cetera, et cetera, all of which are way down. Uh, are we at some risk that we're going to not get stick funding? I know it lags by a year or so, so it won't happen overnight, but it, is there a serious risk here that we should be concerned about? That, that's a great question, uh, Chairman Rotkin, and I'm sorry I, I didn't mention that off the start, uh, but FTA has, you know, has sort of put out some guidance, uh, and Congress agrees with that, that um, FY 2020 essentially didn't count. <laughs> so when they're doing these ridership numbers, essentially what they're saying is you can you can use 19, 2019 or 2020, whichever you want, uh, for the next you know go round with the transit database. So uh, excellent question. Thank you for for reminding me of that. So I think we're okay on that. Uh, Thank you with regard to those those numbers. Go ahead. Um, as far as the Senate, they have not moved as quickly on, uh, particularly on the transit uh, portion of the Fast Act reauthorization. Back in the summer of 2019, uh, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee approved the highway title of the Fast Act reauthorization, but none others. The Senate, you, you folks may have heard me talk about this before, but the Senate has several different committees with jurisdiction over highway transit, you know, the Fast Act. So we've got the Senate Environment Public Works Committee, which does highways. We have the Senate Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committee, which handles transit. We have the Senate Commerce Committee, which handles railroads and safety issues, uh, whereas all of those are, are the, uh, in the jurisdiction of one committee, the House Transportation Committee. It takes a little longer for the Senate to get going, but they did in 2019 put together, uh, and again, Republican-controlled, a pretty robust highway title that included a lot of money for climate change initiatives. It was, a, it was done in a real bipartisan way. Uh, unfortunately, the Banking Committee and the Commerce Committee haven't done anything on their portions uh, of, a, of, a, of a fast act reauthorization. So, um, so again, what, what, what is needed here is, is an extension similar to a, a CR to extend the budget. Uh, highway and transit programs need an extension to continue to use those highway trust fund dollars to pay for the programs. 
uh, after September 30th. And so uh, in that CR that I just mentioned with the FY 2021 budget, there is a one year uh, extension of the FAST Act. So it'll be through September 30th, 2021, giving Congress an extra year to, um, to, to handle uh, the, the, uh, the reauthorization. My guess is that like the, the differences here are not going to be in policy. It's going to be, you know, how to pay for it. You know, again, uh, and you can see how down here that the House bill, uh, again, would need about $140 billion in additional funds to get to pay for that bill. This is in addition to what they expect to come into the Highway Trust Fund. So uh, does, it, it, does it mean a gas tax increase? Do we finally, you know, go to vehicle miles traveled uh, that we've been talking about for 10 years? Uh, do we dip into the general fund to pay for that? These are all the questions that are that are going to be debated uh, over the next year or so. Um, and I will mention that that you know the House committee that deals with this sort of thing is the House Ways and Means Committee. It's the Tax Writing Committee, uh, of which um, Congressman Panetta is a member. So uh, we will be deeply involved in all of these uh, discussions over the next year. Next up, uh, please. So infrastructure package, I think in February, I'd like declared infrastructure dead, you know, and like I even had like a goofy little, you know, image of a, of a gravestone, but uh, people kind of keep bringing it back. And, uh, and I will say that, uh, you know, the house uh, put together uh, this summer, a, a $1.5 trillion package uh, that included, uh, you can see here, water infrastructure, school construction, wireless broadband, energy grid. It had had pretty much everything in it. Five billion of that 1.5 trillion represented that fast act reauthorization. So it was good news, bad news here in that you know they they did a fast act reauthorization. They got it on the floor. They approved it, but and and it included some significant increases. But it. The, the the House's idea of an infrastructure package kind of included a fast act reauthorization, which they have to do anyway, right? And so it didn't include any what I would call new stimulus for transportation. Now, you know, I think you know folks on, in Congress would say, you know, gosh, you know, you can't complain about this. We're giving you you know a fifty percent increase in in funding in the fast act. What are you doing? But you know, I think that I, I think that we we were hoping that. Congress could, you know, walk and chew gum and do a fast act reauthorization and provide us some additional stimulus funding. So, and that particularly hurts if, you know, if, if no COVID funding you know, comes around. So, again, all of these things are sort of weirdly connected, and you know, so we're hoping that, you know, that it, that it all comes to, you know, the pass that that the Congress realizes that all of it is necessary, needed, and can be used. So, that uh, that. Uh, um, that infrastructure package also included a bunch of tax incentives for green energy, and it did include Congressman Panetta's uh, legislation that uh, we worked with him on to, um, uh, as did Joshua Michael, uh, to uh, do a tax credit for the manufacture of electric buses. So we're hoping that that would lower the lower the cost of electric buses sometime down the road. Uh, and as I said before, the the Senate's not likely to consider this infrastructure package in 2020. Uh, the the Senate Republicans are not are not eager to uh, to um, to do any any more deficit spending at this point. Next slide, please. And then you know the last thing I just was going to say elections and unfortunately, like I said, I I have no crystal ball here. I I, I couldn't tell you what's going to happen in November, but I will say that the results are going to have a really big impact on on all of these things. So for instance. Um, if you know if Congress is going to come back into session after November third for what they would call a, a lame duck session between November sometime in November and the end of the year, which they will have to do because at the very least they will have to deal with that budget FY 2021 budget that continuing resolution expires on December 11th. They've got to come and deal with it. Um, and so, do you do COVID relief there? Do you negotiate on? An infrastructure package. Do you do you even talk about a fast act bill? All of these things could conceivably be done in a um, in a, a lame duck session in December, or November. Um, but the results of the election are going to impact that. So if you know if uh, if we have a change in the in in the White House and we have a change in the Senate and Democrats control all three, they're in no position to want to negotiate with Republicans on anything budget, <laughs> fast act, infrastructure, anything, because they'll say, hold on, in, in January, we're in charge. Uh, so we're, we, we don't need to negotiate. 
if things, you know, sort of either stay the same or mi mixed up a little bit, might be a little bit more um, interest in, in negotiating on some, some of these things. So, so it, re it really will, we could, we could have a really kind of boring uh, November, December, or, you know, it could be kind of, you know, all bets are off and, and everything is, you know, going to happen there. Uh, of course, you know, you know, sort of wired into all of that too is we're going to have you know a, um, a, a Supreme Court justice um, being uh, confirmed during that time, very likely uh, hearings, votes, uh, that sort of thing. So, so that'll add to the to the um, that'll add to things, but I don't think it will have any impact on any of the things we just talked about. You know, I think that, that you know the people in Congress who are dealing with the Supreme Court justice thing. Are not the same that would be dealing with your budget with your tax act. And that sort of stuff. So that was about it. Happy to answer any questions uh, you guys have, or if I forgot anything. Thank, thanks again for your time. Thanks, Chris. Let me begin with a question. Sure. Um, to use your colorful, colorful uh, boxing metaphor, Santa Cruz tends to punch above its weight in your in your words, in terms of our lobbying effect in Washington D.C. and perhaps in Sacramento, but in D.C. And that's partly based upon an annual trip we used to take um, with several leaders from the district going to lobby the members of Congress. We're not doing that, obviously. Um, I wonder to what extent you think there is a kind of a uh, online virtual lobbying effort that we should or need to, I mean, we don't know now, but at some point, if it turns out that Congress does have an appetite for doing something between the election and uh, the end of the year, uh, whether you be in a position to help us organize a, an effective virtual lobbying, uh, would that be something that's useful or how would we do that? Or what thoughts do you have about that at this point? Absolutely. Uh, you know, thanks. Thanks again for that that question as well. That's something that Alex and I have been talking about. You know, if is there a right time uh, to do such a virtual fly-in, as they you know like call it, uh, where we can get you know sort of folks on either on the phone or on Zoom to, uh, to talk about these issues. And yeah, we we talk about that a lot. And, and I think I think that there will be you know there will be a time you know in the not too distant future where where that would be you know an effective thing to do. Yes. Are there other members of the board who have questions or comments? Looking. Okay. Let's see any. And Mr. Chair, if you wanted to check the public, I don't see any hands up. Okay, then let me ask, are there members of the public who would like to comment on the federal legislative report? No hands, sir. I see nothing. All right, thank you, Chris. Stay safe and we appreciate your report. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Our next item is item number 14. This is to accept and file a Metro Planning Development Annual Status Report. I must say, I read this report last night. I found it fascinating. We're, we're doing an amazing number of things. I mean, given our other crises and problems and everything else, it's amazing how many things are in, irons are in the fire in terms of what our district is up to in terms of new initiative, not just maintaining what we do or struggling to maintain what we do, but actually expanding our service and improving the way we deliver the service. So uh, I'm looking forward to a, a, a report here from uh, John Ergo, our Planning and Development Director. John, take it away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Directors. John Ergo, Planning and Development Director. Um, it's been one year since the last Metro Planning Department annual update. Uh, this reporting effort uh, started following the comprehensive operational analysis in 2016. And uh, in the years following, Metro ridership uh, more or less maintained itself at about 5 million passenger boardings per year in spite of national trends to the contrary. This is my first go around as planning director and oh, what a year. Um, 2020 uh, is really a tale of two years and it may seem moot to talk about it at this point, but I think it's important to highlight that prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Metro ridership was actually on an upward trend. Um, ridership had increased through the first seven months of the fiscal year, about two and a half percent, driven largely by a 6% increase in UCSC and UCSC rents. Uh, following the outbreak, of course, and the accompanying service changes, ridership declined over 90%, and we ended the year about 30% uh, less in FY20 compared to FY19, also commensurate with national trends. Um, Currently, all routes are operating below industry accepted standards for productivity. This is happening everywhere in the country as shelter in place, work from home, school closings continue to take effect. It 
it suggests somewhat that we should set aside the traditional metrics for the time being, uh, recognize that public transit is an essential service that supports essential workers and travel, equity, environmental goals, and I would say the general functioning of society. Um, but it also suggests that we need to focus our resources to where they're needed most. And as you saw in the report, the, the primary service related initiative uh, currently and, and during FY21 will be the development of a COVID-19 service recovery plan. As we've presented in the past, we uh, conducted a COVID-19 rider survey, the results of which will inform uh, that plan and, service and future service planning efforts. And we really hope that this plan uh, will be a living document. So given the uncertainty around the timing and phasing of relaxation or strengthening of shelter in place orders, the reopening of the economy, health orders, particularly as they might affect our vehicle capacity. This is a plan that we'll need to, that, that one that we'll bring to the board, but one that we'll continue to revisit as we go through the year. Um, and in fact, we've, we've already implemented kind of what we think is the first phase of this plan, which is the restoration of full service on all local routes uh, with the major exception of UCSC. Um, and of course, Highway 17 is also not, has not been restored. So we're currently at about 25% uh, lower in terms of revenue service hours than we were at this time last year. Um, on paper, this is going to look like too much service, um, but it was done in response to the survey that, that showed the majority of our riders uh, and particularly our frequent riders cited the restoration of service as the most important thing that they're looking forward to coming back um, and encouraging them to ride Metro currently uh, and more in the future, along with cleaning, sanitization, forcing face masks and PPE, uh, which we're also doing on board our vehicles. So again, we're continuing to work on this plan. Um, we'll, we will bring a draft uh, to the board at a future meeting. The, uh, the next major effort, so there's a lot that's in the report. I'm just gonna highlight a few of the major efforts and then I'd, I'd be happy to talk about any of the other items and answer questions um, and everything that's in there. Um, but the next major effort is the contactless fare payment, which started pre-COVID as our mobile ticketing pilot. It, we were planning to launch um, on Highway 17. Uh, coming out of the pandemic, we decided to accelerate this effort. And on September 3rd, uh, we launched mobile ticketing across all local services. So as of now, uh, any customer can buy a met any Metro Pass product on their mobile phone. It's a flash pass to ride any Metro service. And besides uh, the importance of reducing any exposure risk between operators and customers at the fare box, this, this project has the added benefits of speeding up the boarding process um, and expanding fare products uh, throughout, throughout the system. So the, the mobile flash pass was the first phase. It's implemented. The next phase will be installing mobile ticketing validators on board Highway 17. So these are actually physical validators where customers can tap their mobile phone or a smart card. And the future phase will be developing a fully account-based system with store value accounts. Um, and this will allow us to do some really interesting things. And particularly, it will allow us to expand uh, cash acceptance throughout the district at retail locations. Um, through either exchanging cash for a mobile ticket or through a new smart card that, that will roll out along with this effort. Um, we've, we've already sold some mobile tickets. Uh, we've about, I think, are, are near doubling what we did the first week. It's only been in operation two weeks, uh, but so far uh, people are using it, uh, which is exciting to see. The, uh, the next major effort I want to highlight is our bus stop signage update. So staff is currently working on a bus stop uh, signage update that would that helps to bring Metro's bus stop signs in line with industry best practices and better guide customers through the Metro's uh, service and informational systems. I would say that our current signage provides a lot of useful information if you know it's there and if you're looking for it. And this effort uh, will feature double-sided signs uh, that you can see from both directions larger route numbering, color coding according to service type to enforce Metro's brand identity through the, uh, strengthen Metro's brand identity throughout the community um, and improve the customer experience, both of which we think are critical to re retaining existing customers uh, and drawing new riders into the system. Again, we'll be bringing more details uh, on this, I believe at the next board meeting. 
We are also in the process of uh, launching a pilot program for on-demand transit service. Uh, the service uh, would allow customers to book trips on demand, curb to curb. And the basic idea is, you know, we've talked a lot about the ridership declines in fixed route service. The same thing is happening on the paracruise side. And so what the idea behind this project is to open up some of that capacity uh, for customers to book on-demand trips through our paracruise operation. So at first we'd prioritize paratransit trips and then which need to be booked 24 hours in advance. And then on the day of or, or completely on demand, customers would be able to book trips into the system curb to curb. Um, the, ca the caveat being that rather than the paracruise trip, which can happen from any point in the district to any other point in the district, this service would be focused on several zones. So the Watsonville area, Aptos, Lasola Beach, Capitola, Live Oak, um, Santa Cruz, Westside, and Scotts Valley, uh, with the idea that its its main purpose is shorter trips. So first, last mile, but also opening up new origin destinations that aren't possible on the current fixed route network. So look look for more of the, um, that to come. It also is, is benefited by our new Ecolane app. So customers will be able to use the app. They can also call customer service to book a trip, um, but potentially someone could use the Ecolane app to book an on-demand trip and our new mobile ticketing to purchase their fare. Um, lastly, uh, planning is also underway for the introduction of our new zero emission bus circulator service in Watsonville in early 2021. I know that this has been in the works for some time uh, and was significantly delayed as a, real, as a result of COVID-19. Um, the buses have not been delivered yet. We expect delivery of the zero emission vehicles uh, in late this year, possibly early next year, um, testing acceptance. And during that time, we'll work out, we'll work through the public outreach and planning uh, aspects of the circulator itself. I think those were the main efforts I wanted to highlight from the report. There's a lot else, a lot of other things that are in there, you know, continuation of the Santa Cruz uh, EcoPass will also bring a report to that on that issue on that initiative next month. Um, AVL, a number of other, a number of other things in the report, but um, Mike Dan on AVL told the public what what's that? AVL. Yes, I know what it is, but automatic vehicle locator. So this this will um, has now been installed, I believe, on on all of our buses, and it will allow real time customer information and also lots of planning data on. Uh, transit travel speeds throughout the district. Thank you. So that concludes my remarks, but I'd be happy to answer and, and discuss any other efforts that are highlighted in the report. Are there questions from board members? Yeah, I, I just have a comment, Mike, and it, I mean- um, oh, Go ahead, Bruce. No, well, just... of COVID and uh, fire, whatever, um, you know, I think it's really, uh, uh, really great of how many things we're, we're addressing. Uh, they will all come to fruition and uh, in abundance uh, before we know it, I hope. But uh, I, I really want to thank John and uh, the whole district team for keeping us on track with what we were doing, the, the electric buses, everything that's, that's all good about uh, travel, letting people know where the bus is, AVL and so forth. There's a lot of things that are going at the same time. There's a lot of things on your plate, John and uh, Alex and the whole team. And I just want to say thank you for sticking with it. Uh, this too shall become reality. I hope in the very near future, all of the above. And uh, I just want to thank you for all of your efforts and keeping us on track with uh, providing better service uh, when things get back to normal, whenever they, that may be. So thank you very much. Thanks, Bruce. I'm sure you're speaking for all of us. Cynthia Matthews next and then John Leopold. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for this report, John, and everybody else who put it together. It was so clear and comprehensive to the lay reader, <laughs> very well organized. I appreciated that you gave stats and then the trends and then the reasons for those trends. And I, I just thought it was excellent. And the critical decisions that we'll be facing and things that will be our priority considerations in making those decisions. So. Um, my experience out here in the world is that, you know, 
all the city council members and all the candidates and all the community, they all want public transportation and you should do this and why aren't you doing this and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, it's all these things are really easy and obvious if you don't know <laughs> more of the details. And um, I'm actually going to share this with the other council members and um, community members and candidates, in fact. Um, <laughs> I just found it in a few pages very informative. So I just want to thank you for that. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah. John Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I do want to recognize the, the work that's going on. You know, if, as we seek to increase, you know, bring our riders back after COVID um, or when people feel comfortable, these tools uh, from the um, from the automated AP, what is it? AVL. 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 Sorry, I just lost that. I thought it was thinking AP. Automatic. <laughs> Uh, AVL, the the uh, the mobile ticket, the, the, all those pieces become really important. That's what people are expecting in transit. We have been talking about that for a long time here. Uh, I know it's been it's been a, a work of a number of different folks. Uh, you know, I know I think Isaac has been involved with this, and others have been involved uh, to help make this happen. And then when er, earlier in the um, uh, the report about you know our our transit replacement uh, plan, you know, it all feeds into that whole piece, right, which is uh, we are modernizing uh, the uh, metro in a way that I think will attract riders and will uh, help us uh, grow over time. So thanks for the work. Uh, thanks for the work of everybody keeping it going, especially during these difficult times. Thank you. Are there other board members with questions or comments? Yeah, I, I just want to add my my appreciation as well. I mean, I've been amazed at how well everyone has adjusted to still working towards these goals and still accomplishing the things while while we're trying to adjust to life with COVID. I mean, just amazing work everyone's been doing, and and uh, just as everyone else has said, uh, other board members have said, we just. Uh, Really appreciate and proud to be serving with everyone with the board here. Are there questions from board members? Yeah, I like it. <clears throat> Aurelio. Yeah, uh, back from the city of Watson, we'd like to thank you for all the work you guys have been doing. Uh, I know we're, we're a major part of the, the transit service uh, riders, <clears throat> and the, the new AVL will actually be really beneficial for a lot of the folks within the city of Watsonville. Um, so thank you for your work. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else from the board? I don't see a hand. Members of the public who might like to comment on this report. You have Mr. Sandoval. James, go ahead. Hi, John. Um, I just had a quick question. I did see that the on-demand on pilot is planned for late fall. If that's this year, um, I was wondering if you were planning to meet and confer with the union because I believe the Paracruz contract uh, in 9.06 actually prohibits on-demand service. So I just was wondering if that's in your plan. Yes, we'll do that. So th this is initial planning. Um, again, the idea was to serve additional on-demand trips, but we'll certainly schedule that meet and confer. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question and the response. I have a question. Um, have we, John, have we thought about what the price of a ride on on-demand is? Or there was no mention of that in the report. Uh, so the same as Paracruz is what we're thinking. So $4 flat, flat fare uh, for that type of trip. Thank you. Any other questions? From either of the board members or the public? Thanks again for your report, John. It was really frequent, I think, by the board. I'm members. glad it was useful. You never know who's going to read these things, but I'm, I'm glad it'll, it'll no, be. No, it's a very enlightening, I have to say. Okay, we're done with item number 14. You're now have a, you're also on again for an oral uh, update on what's happening with Pacific Station. Yes, so um, this effort has also been re-energized in recent uh, weeks and months, so Staff has met with the City of Santa Cruz uh, staff on two occasions uh, recently to discuss the joint redevelopment projects at Pacific Station. 
And the discussions have specifically focused on whether to apply uh, for the next round of affordable housing and sustainable communities uh, grant program, which would be uh, due in February 2021. As the board may recall, the MOU that was approved in June left open the question of whether uh, the city and Metro would be applying uh, for this next round or in 2022. Um, and it, it looks like that at least draft uh, proposed changes in the ASIC or AHSC guidelines could make this year particularly favorable uh, for this project. Um, particularly, there's a uh, geographic set aside to fund a project in the Central Coast region. And there are some changes to the scoring of projects related to greenhouse gas reductions that, uh, as a result of transit, that in the past have favored larger transit agencies. Um, all that said, it's there's still a lot to be worked out um, from these initial meetings. It's not, it, it doesn't appear that the, on their side, that the city has committed to which site they want to apply for in this round, whether the Pacific Station site or some other site. Um, and consequently, uh, we have been asked to consider other types of transit projects that, that we might want to fund through this grant application that don't involve joint, the joint Pacific Station redevelopment, such as the procurement of zero emission vehicles for service expansion. Um, that's somewhat of a challenging ask. And from Metro's standpoint, uh, we are considering that, but we're ready to support an application that is in line with the MOU and specifically that involves a turnkey 24 bus bay facility at Pacific Station as outlined. Um, the city has re-raised concerns about the footprint of the 24 bus bay design, and we're open to revisiting the specifics of the design, but we're, we're committed to the 24 bus bays as has been studied for many years and as was laid out in the MOU. Um, so there's still a lot to be worked on. We've now committed to meet weekly um, along with the city's consultants that are working on the ASIC grant. So at least from the standpoint today, I would say it seems unlikely that we apply this February, even though it is a favorable round, unless we can get to agreement on uh, funding specifically Pacific Station redevelopment in this round and uh, whatever mixed use housing project the city wants to put forward on their side. That, uh, that's the update on Pacific Station. Are there questions from board members about this update? Cynthia Matthews. Uh, it's not a question, but I'll say I just talked with Bonnie that's come this morning just to check in. And um, our staff is really committed <laughs> with everything else on their plate to try and uh, resolve the unknowns and make obviously it has to work for both parties in order to work. So um, I just want to relay that, that message to the board. And Bonnie, for those who don't know, is the head of the uh, development. Development. Correct. Development agency now it's called, I believe. Economic Development Agency. Yeah. Other questions from board members? Mm -hmm. Are there questions or comments from members of the public? Chair, you have uh, Heather Edmondson from AMBAG. Heather, please uh, welcome to the meeting. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? You can. You're fine. Thank you. Uh, my name is Heather Adamson. I'm the planning director at AMBAG. And um, over the past six cycles of the uh, SGC's Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities um, Program, AMBAG's really been pushing them hard uh, to modify their guidelines to, you know, have a great opportunity for Central Coast projects to compete. Um, as you may know, we've competed in earlier uh, projects from the AMBAG Central Coast area, have competed, submitted, and we just have not fared very well. Um, we have pushed for over five years for a geographic equity. Um, and now it looks like the proposed draft guidelines, which will be approved in the next couple months, will have that in there. And I just really, Pacific Station really is the poster child of the type of project that this program would like to fund. And I would really just uh, encourage the city and Metro to work together to get a project in for round six, knowing that um, this geographic uh, particular uh, apportionment could really benefit uh, awarding a project in our region. 
and I'm happy to work with uh, Metro staff and and Bonnie. I've talked to Bonnie at the City of Santa Cruz staff and anything that we can do to help at AMBAG to help with the application, we'd, we'd more than happy to do so. Thank you, we appreciate your support. Yeah, Mr. Chair? Yes, Alex. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can be a little bit more blunt than, than John. John's real good at being careful on this one, but I just wanna let you know um, for transparency purposes, this this is going to be a challenge. This the city staff has basically thrown us a left curve here, and we're a little bit surprised at this late date at that happening. Um, you know, we spent nearly two years uh, in partnership with the city, the city co-funding a study that did, answered the question: Does does the bus uh, operations have to be centralized in the downtown or not? The answer to that after a study was yes, for the particular geographic um, challenges that we have in this county, a bus hub in the downtown is the way to go. The second question that was studied during that two year process was the number of bus bays. As you might recall, the city really wanted us to have far fewer bus bays. We said we need to not only accommodate our current service needs, but we need to be thinking about the future and not foreclose opportunities to grow. The study was co-funded. Study said you, th this is the number of bus bays that, that you need to uh, address current operations and plan for the future. So we thought after a lot of money and a lot of time, that question was answered. We were a little surprised that that question has returned all of a sudden recently. Um, in addition to that, this, this pr proposal or propensity potential proposal from the city that we go in for a grant, but instead of going the path that we had planned all along, which is to jointly apply for this grant and the money in conjunction with the 4 million that you've allocated would rebuild this facility, this new tarmac facing Front Street and parcel off commercial, residential, retail, all that on, on Pacific Avenue. Uh, we thought that's that's what we've all been working for, but now this new proposal suddenly has popped up in which um, they would propose to fund buses and other things that, that they think we might have money on. Um, and if the AHSC grant were to pay for that, um, that would free up money in addition to our 4 million. That's just not reality. There, there isn't that kind of money programmed for Pacific Station at all that can be freed up. And so part of what John's challenge will be in working with city staff in the coming weeks is to get them back focused on what we all had agreed upon. The project that goes for AHSC grant is not only what they're doing in the, in the commercial retail housing side between our property and Laurel, but would fund the difference between you know, what, what we have available, the 4 million you committed, and whatever the cost of the, the ultimate build out of the tarmac is. Remember, our agreement under the MOU is they build us a, a turnkey project. So we need to get them refocused on that uh, or else the, the deal as envisioned and as approved by you is in serious jeopardy. Thanks for that clarity. Well, we'll be optimistic that we can work this out between the agencies. Are there any other comments from board members or questions? John Leopold. Well, I, I've been on this board uh, for 12 years. We've been talking about this project. I thought that we were we, we were getting to a place where it was actually going to uh, move. And I'm confident that we can make that happen, right? I mean, I think there's on the part of Metro and there's definitely interest on the part of the city, but we have to, to the best we can, stick to a plan. I mean, we, we spent all that money on, on, a, on a study I'd hate to throw that out. There's a there's a lot of work that the that the metro has done to to be ready for this project. There's very clear that Pacific Station is in desperate need as the as the information that we have, right? It's the it's the worst uh, out of all of our facilities. It's the worst one. It rates the lowest in the in the transit asset uh, uh, information that's in uh, today's board packet. So um, I'm I'm really hoping we can start getting um, better forward momentum on this um, because it'd be the, the, the customer, our customers are definitely want that to, to change. We have an interest in, in changing that and we want to work with the city. So um, 
I, I hope that that everybody can work together to, to really so we can get some forward motion instead of just study, 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 study. So thanks for your comments. Any other questions, comments? Donna Myers. Yeah, I'll just I'll just chime in. Um, I've spoken uh, with our economic development department a few times over the last couple of days. I think um, they are very much intending, as John mentioned, um, trying to figure this out in the near term. Um, the you know the city is balancing a lot of moving pieces in the Front Street and Pacific Avenue area, and 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 so part of this you know, analysis and accommodating what, what really is in the MOU is, is really looking at those needs on the ground as we work through um, access and various things in terms of widths and, you know, it's one thing to have a drawing, it's another to actually put it on the ground. So I think our staff is acutely aware of the importance of maintaining um, the intent of the MOU. And uh, I know that they'll be working very diligently over the next week to try to I'll square this up and um, but uh, just want to let the public and the rest of the board know that the city certainly is is not trying to uh, turn this into something different so it's it's really just a matter of trying to put these two these projects on the ground amidst other opportunities in that particular area so uh, and I spoke with Alex earlier this week so uh, I do think that there's a very very clear intent on the city side to uh, try to keep moving on this thanks Hopefully we'll come together. Any other comments from board members? Any comments from members of the public? I don't see any hands, Mr. Chair. Nor do I. Okay, our last item is an oral update from Daniel Zaragoza, the operations manager of the Santa Transit Division. Take it away, Daniel. I think uh, Margo, our COO, is going to introduce this item, and I believe we have also a representative from our contractor. Good, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Board of Directors. Um, we have an update from our contractor regarding, you had a couple of questions about space and um, square footage. Are you, let me see if he's on. I don't see him. Do you, Alex? No, he's not on the call. No, I don't see him. Oh, oh, Ken. Ken is here. Ken Hart. Okay. Yeah, he's got his hand up. Ken, you're you're showing as muted. Okay. There he is. Better now. We hear you now. Thanks. Ken. All right. So this is Ken Hart with Swift Consulting. I understand that there have been some questions by board members about the size of the building uh, at the for the Paracruz um, facility. Uh, before I. Um, comment on that. I just wanted to say that we have received proposals uh, on the for the project for for the design team from archaeologists, traffic engineer, noise uh, consultant, and landscape architect. Um, I wasn't listening to the uh, meeting earlier, but uh, assuming that you adopted uh, you approved item nine dash ten and added Mark Thomas as the project engineer. We did. I think we can begin in earnest um, now with the design of the project and the most important initial step is to lay out this, the site, especially in terms of parking and uh, circulation for the vans. The building that we've talked about and that staff is, um, is supportive of would be a 4,000 square foot building that would house the 13 Veracruz staff um, and create a mobility center, which would, uh, would uh, assess the, the needs of the community in, in terms of um, service by the Paracruz um, program. Now, uh, the final building size, even though we've, we've indicated that 4,000 square feet would be the ideal, it's going to be determined kind of an iterative process through the design, um, the design process. And that's going to be, again, um, based on the layout of the site for parking and on-site circulation. Okay. Any other comments on this item? Margo and Ken? Uh, no, not at this time. Thank you for that report. Are there questions? Mike, uh, I just want to make a comment. 
Um, uh, because of the nature of my life, I had the opportunity to walk the neighborhood around uh, the park and ride lot. And uh, the, the feelings about Metro were very strong. They were very much, they appreciated the information that Metro has provided. They appreciated the, the design concept and doing something with the, with the site. Um, yeah, it's not often that I, that I, that I've walked neighborhoods and people have just, they just have a warm glow about Metro. And so I just want to thank the team um, and just the responsiveness um, and the, and the folks helping maintain the lot right now and everything we've done. It, it's, it's really made a difference in that neighborhood they've noticed. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. That's an exciting moment. Are there other questions from board members? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, just to add one other uh, element that we'll try to fast track uh, for possible consideration, uh, we will investigate whether or not it would make sense to also co-locate our customer service center in the same facility. As you, as you think about the discussion that we just had about Pacific Avenue, um, if that comes to fruition, dur during construction, uh, we'll, we'll have uh, no place for our customer service function because it is in the building that would be demolished. Uh, and the new tarmac doesn't envision that function being there because we would only have a very small building that would accommodate some customer service or customer interface for past sales, um, op operator break room and, and uh, operator restroom. So very, very small building envisioned there. Um, so for the time being, if that comes to fruition, it is assumed that customer service would have to be in some sort of leased space somewhere else. Um, that might not be the optimal thing to do. So we'll also investigate whether or not it, it makes sense to co-locate it in this new building um, and resolve a couple of problems here. Thank you for that. Okay, are there members of the public? Again, with any questions or comments here? I don't see any hands. You had uh, Director Bottorf. Bottorf, go ahead, member of the board. You're, you had a couple of questions, and I'm hoping that there's somebody here that can answer them. Um, the, it looks like the, 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 the size that was quoted on, it's kind of moving all over the place, is now 4,000 square feet for the new building. My question is, how big is the existing space that we are leasing now? Yeah, Margo, did you get that number? Uh, it was over 3,000 square feet, I believe. Um, but it's kind of all, um, it's not all centralized, if, if that makes sense. Um, this will be more centralized and provide um, more room for more employees. We'll centralize our peer transit um, uh, facilities for everyone. Um, 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 members of the public can come in and um, get travel trained and um, we can provide um, services for the public. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that answer. The, my, my main concern, what I'm really looking for is I want to know the square footage of the building that we're now leasing. I know it includes some inside office space and there is some covered parking uh, quasi garage type unit. And I know that the new place was planning to have uh, maybe, uh, I was primarily for some inside office, maybe, of covered parking, maybe not. So I'm really specific about, you know, we're gonna be in budget constraints, how much we're gonna be spending. And, and I know that for a fact that if that building that we lease is 3,000 square feet, it was probably minimum 50% occupied, which makes me wonder why if we're only using 1,500 square feet of an existing building, why we need 4,000 square feet. I am, I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative of the fact that Alex has mentioned there may be a need for customer service and that there is future need for that building. But I know that as we start designing these buildings, I, I unfortunately just got done building a 9,500 square foot library in Capitola that went to 12,000 square feet and went $2 million over budget. So I, I'm, I'm trying to just get a handle on the fact that this is a much needed facility. I believe Alex uh, believes this is a priority building and I, I tend to agree with that. And I know that we're all trying to get Pacific Station to come together, but this is one that we may or may not receive grants for. It may require funding. And the size is really critical to me. So I, I, I'd like to have some further discussion on, on why we're 
increasing the size of this building over a facility that we have that we don't use at 50%. So I'd like to get some input or discussion or meet with somebody to explain to me why we're going down that path. Thank you. Yeah, Director Butter, if, if I might suggest, let's bring it back to committee next month with the actual diagrams. I mean, if we're quoting 4,000 square feet, we should have a diagram to support that. Um, you know, one of one of the features that isn't there today that they spoke about earlier is the travel training feature. I believe, if I recall correctly, we're sort of modeling that off of something that we've learned from our our um, colleagues to the south, MST, um, and so that that is something that's not in the current facility today. But why don't we bring back the actual um, at least a high level diagram? As we, we must be working from something in order to be at four thousand square feet. Uh, if, we, if we could bring this back to the capital committee, I would really like the input of that committee to, to look at this. And, and, you know, we just approved the engineer. It looks like we're starting to move forward with this, but I don't want to get too far out in front until we actually have an idea about how much we need. So I think that's great if we can bring it back to capital and get, get some kind of parameters about a, a working size. So thanks for that suggestion, Alex. And thanks for raising that concern. Sounds like it will be that it will come back to that committee. Any other questions or comments from board members about the paratransit uh, building? Okay, and members of the public, any comments? Seeing none. No hands, Mr. Chair. I'm going to run back now. I should have done this earlier, but it'd make it quicker. We'll do. I'm going to have looking for a motion on items number 13, 14. Um, 12, 13, and 14 to accept and file the reports that we got. Uh, we should take a motion on that. That requires a roll call vote. And that'll be our last action of the day. Larry Pegler is moving that. And the model is seconding it. Any other comments about that? All right, we've already taken public comment on the, on the matter. So let's have a roll call vote and uh, basically accepting and filing these reports. And I'm sorry, Alex was trying to mute me again. So who was the motion and the second on those two, please? Motion was Ben Pegler and the second was uh, Donna Myers. Thank you. Other Donna. The other Donna, got it. The other okay. Donna, Donna Lynch. Taking, huh? No, it was Donna Myers. Oh, Donna Myers. Okay. Maybe Donna Lynch both, was talking. We both team. tried, but I think Donna Myers beat me. <laughs> <laughs> you got Quick. the other one, Donna Lynn. Yeah. There we go. A little jeopardy. She was quicker than unmuting herself. <laughs> so we're taking agenda items 13 and 14 together. 12, 12 13, and 14. I'll have a 12, 13, motion 14. to accept and file those reports. Director Baltorf. Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez. Yes. Director Gonzalez. He's muted. Aye. Thank you. Director Leopold. Aye. Director Lind. Aye. Director Matthews. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Rothwell. Aye. Director Rutkin. Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, that concludes our meeting. We're fortunate in not having a closed session today, which is a rare a rare pleasure. Uh, not that we don't enjoy meeting with our uh, our uh, legal representation, our council. Um, our next meeting will be Friday, October 23rd, uh, 2020 at 9 a.m. I'm going to assume that it will be a Zoom conference again. It's unlikely we'll be uh, having public meetings by that point, unfortunately. Um, and we are now prepared to adjourn. We don't really need a motion on that. I'm going to simply declare that we're adjourning the meeting. I want to thank the staff for all the work they're doing, the heroes that work for us that are out there interfacing with the public, our bus drivers and other folks uh, throughout the agency. It really makes a difference that people are uh, serving the public in this way. And I want to thank them for their great service and appreciate uh, the, the work that they're doing for our community. And we're about to adjourn this meeting. We are adjourned. Everybody stay safe and take care. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody.